My name is Aljamal Bight. I'm the chair of the board of the movement. I'm all for race equity. For some of you who don't know what the organization is, it's been around for 10 years. It used to do policy research and innovation and progressive Omaha. And our whole mission is to deal with anti-racism, race issues, but also to host book group meetings, uh, community forums from time to time. And also we've done a lot of Zoom, Facebook Live events. And this is one of the events that fits right within our mission. We have about 15 members on our board. We have a couple of them here tonight and we're kind of excited to hear. And uh, one of the things I would just kind of give a shout out is I, Scott Hazelrig has uh, been in charge of working with this organization for North Star for many years. And so I talked to him, I had a meeting with him. We were in a leadership class over 20 years ago. And I said, I'd like to have a meeting over at your location. He said, okay, no problem. So we decided to come out and have a meeting here. The last meeting was over at Fabric Lab. But what we're trying to do is get more of our families and community members to meet public and elected officials in the community and to have moderated conversations to deal with issues. So. We're going to keep this as informal as possible. The framework or the format of tonight is just a brief introduction. I'm going to let each one of our, our, let our guests introduce himself a little bit more and talk a little about it. And then Terry Crawford is a, a co-moderator with me today. She's also working in different capacities. She's known as a community African and so has a law degree. She'll share a little bit more about herself. And uh, she also co-facilitated the meeting probably about a month or so ago with the Legal Aid of Nebraska as well as ACLU. So I came with the generic questions, she came with the legal questions, and we did a tag team. They call us pit bulls after that, but it was a wonderful discussion. Again, it's kind of an event where we try to deconstruct some of the stuff we don't hear in our community directly from the policy makers and people out there. So we're kind of excited about that. So two quick things I wanted to say. Uh, we're, we're going to allow Tom Wright to say some opening comments at, in the beginning, and then we're going to have a series of questions for him. Uh, he'll give a little introduction. Terry's going to also so give a little bit of introduction on herself to so know who she is. And then we're going to kind of keep it informal. Then we have probably wait about 20 minutes or 15 minutes, whatever. We're going to throw it out to y'all and let y'all raise any questions, issues, no filters. And some of you don't know this, but for about 25 years, I've facilitated community forums at Catholic Church at St. Martin's, and we have open forums, but the key thing, no profanity, but other than that, people can ask questions. We also have little timers that people get long winded. We turn a little timer on here to keep your focus, but like table talk, you know, so we're kind of excited to get people to do this. We wish more nonprofits would do this because as we look at our society and our community, more and more people need to brought, be brought together. So we're kind of excited tonight about that. So without much further ado, let me, I'm gonna let Terry introduce herself, and then Tom will introduce herself a little bit. And I just wanna say, Tom, this, I wanted a little side note, says years ago he did a community forum where it's the St. Mars. He's always been open to coming out, talking to people in the community. I was around when he ran for office one time, and that's how I got to meet him and know him. Ted also worked out in Dennis County for a number of years, so we interacted on a criminal justice committee, but he's always been the kind of guy who can talk to folks, and I was elated when he said he would come out and speak to the group and share what's going on in his world and so on. So Terry, I'll let you start off. Terry Crawford, JD, and I'll let you go from there. Okay. And you share anything you want to share about yourself, you know? Uh, thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here to have this conversation. I've known Mr. Riley for a very long time, so I'm really happy that we are having this uh, open forum to have some conversations. We had a paradigm shift in 2020 with everything that happened with George Floyd. After that happened, it opened up a floodgate, I believe, for us to have some deeper conversations about race and in particular in I'll call it criminal legal system and not necessarily the criminal justice system because a lot of times we're lacking justice in it. So I'll just refer to it as the criminal legal system. We're in a space where HBCUs are failing due to funding, but the prison system is making billions of dollars by incarcerating black and brown bodies. So that means we have our priorities mixed up. We should be educating rather than incarcerating. So I'm hoping we can have some of these conversations tonight to talk about what the Office of the Public Defender does and to talk about any misconceptions that we may have or that they may have regarding that connection with the community and the demographics that they serve. Um, so I will stop there. Okay, good. Well, Mr. Riley, I'm going to let you say a little bit about yourself, introduce whatever you want to share, and then we can open it up with your opening comments. And then Karen and I have a series of, I got some questions, she okay. has some, and then we're going to open up to the audience. Fair enough. Um, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm happy to, to be here. Um, my name is Tom Riley. I'm the, currently I'm the Douglas County Public Defender. Um, I 
went to Creighton Law School. I graduated in 75, and I've been in the public defender's office ever since I graduated, so this is my 48th year in the public defender's office. And obviously, well, over those four plus decades, there's been a number of significant uh, changes, some for the better, some not for the better. Um, I uh, will just briefly say that the public defender's office, I'm sure both of you know, but um, at the risk of uh, not, not being clear, um, our statutorily were created um, and our obligation is to represent people who are charged with felonies, misdemeanors, um, juvenile court, delinquency cases. We also handle um, board of mental health commitments. In other words, if an individual is at risk of being involuntarily committed to a mental health institution, we, have, we represent them. We also represent uh, parents who are in danger of losing their parental rights in juvenile court. And finally, we represent individuals who are uh, in danger of going to jail for failure to pay child support. They, they can be held in contempt um, and uh, can, be, it can be jailed uh, if in fact a judge deems them to be in contempt and not doing what the judge thinks they should be doing to get caught up on child support. Um, obviously, being a defense lawyer, we're a reactive entity. Uh, we, we can't get involved pretty much until someone is uh, someone is accused and charged with a crime. Now I will say that there is a, a statute that allows us in felony cases we don't have to be appointed by the court initially. So I've had a number of situations where uh, someone will call me and say, hey, uh, I got a card left in my door. The cops want it want me to come down and talk to them, what should I do? And um, the statute says if they're a suspect, then uh, we, can do, we can do something without being court appointed. So we, we, can, we can get involved in, in those kind of things. And you know, if, if someone's got enough wherewithal to be smart enough to call us before um, they, the, the police interrogate them or the police search their house, um, sometimes you can get a leg up on them and, and uh, maybe prevent some uh, unpleasantries on, on all, all angles. Um, I, uh, we, when I first started, I want to say we had eight or nine, maybe 10 lawyers. Now we have 50 plus. One of the things that's always difficult is retention. Um, the um, grass is always greener and the money's always greener on the other side. Uh, so uh, although we have some lifers, uh, the majority of our staff are younger lawyers, um, and we start them off uh, with mentors to do misdemeanors and um, or juvenile delinquency cases. And then as they get their sea legs, so to speak, um, we'll move them on to lower grade felonies. Uh, there's always a mentorship uh, ability involved, and I would say that um, although I still handle cases, mostly homicides, um, one of the joys of the office for me is mentoring the younger lawyers who have not yet been jaded by getting pounded over the head uh, in the system. And uh, it's, it's refreshing for me and to see you know, young, anxious people that want to go out and help uh, to poor people in our community who can't afford their own attorney. And I, I neglect to say, obviously, that um, our, the clientele that we serve is individuals who cannot afford counsel. And as many of you may know, trying to retain private counsel in even medium-grade felonies or high-grade felonies is extremely expensive. Um, consequently, we end up with a lot of the more serious cases because uh, they, they just, even if they have jobs, um, even if they have uh, make two jobs, uh, they in many cases can't afford counsel. And the statute says you're, you are entitled to appointed counsel if you would be deprived of the basic necessities of life 
if you have to pay uh, council, so um, you know your rent, your food, transportation, all those things are supposed to be included uh, in a judge's determination of whether or not uh, to appoint the council. Obviously, one of the, the I'll close uh, with my opening remark by saying, that oftentimes cases will come along where there are three or four individuals charged with the same offense. Uh, you know, I, like a drive-by shooting, a lot of times there's three or four kids in the car. They all get charged. Um, obviously, we can only represent one of that group. We can't represent both defendants. So in those cases, we end up with one of the uh, accused and the judge will appoint private counsel um, at state expense, or I should say county expense, um, uh, to represent the others. And finally, um, our budget is, we're funded solely and only by Douglas County Board, so that the county, we don't get state money, we don't get federal money. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, I'd rather have to try to beg for money to seven local people than to have the state entity where I have to go down and beg for money for 40 some odd state senators, many of whom could don't really care very much about what's going on here. So there's no perfect way to do this, but I, at least uh, I, I'm, I think this is one of the better ways. <coughs> that, um, those are my opening remarks. Good. So Terry, do you want to start and then I'll go after you and we just back and forth a little bit and then sure. over there, okay? So in um, March of 2023, we celebrated uh, 60 years of Gideon that assured that um, defense to um, those that were facing criminal charges. And, and thank you for going over exactly what that looked like for us. The whole purpose of Gideon, and for those that don't know, Gideon was the case in 1964 that guaranteed the right to counsel in criminal cases uh, throughout the uh, federal system. But I think it also did the same thing on the county level and city level. Basically what had, hap what had happened is, prior to Gideon, the Supreme Court interpreted the federal constitution only to apply to federal court. So if you got charged in federal court, you would get a court-appointed attorney. If you were charged in state court, you're on your own. And in many of the southern states, as you can well imagine, um, they didn't have any public defender system and they didn't have court-appointed attorneys. So Gideon was self-represented and went to prison and filed a federal habeas corpus action and the then Supreme Court, which actually cared about individual rights, uh, determined that the right to counsel in the Sixth Amendment would also apply to the states, thereby requiring states to give counsel to those who cannot, who are charged with an offense and um, uh, killed, couldn't afford counsel. Let me say, Douglas County, believe it or not, is the second oldest public defense, county run public defender's office in the country. It, it, it was in the early 1900s. LA County beat us out by about three months. So in the early 1900s, Nebraska was actually a progressive political state mm -hmm. and created a public defender's office to uh, represent people charged in state court. Federal, the Constitution didn't require it, but the Nebraska legislature at the time thought it was appropriate that people who were charged with crimes should be going in against an attorney, prosecutor, and have to fend for themselves. So um, I hope that clears that up a little bit. It does. <coughs> so can you talk about some of the primary challenges that our public defender's office in Douglas County faces when representing the indigent and how that impacts their uh, access to justice? and what that looks like when you have uh, attorneys that have very high caseloads okay. in your office. We, um, we do have high caseloads, but um, I have one, you don't know Martha, I think Martha Dunn, mm -hmm. and she's an attorney who has a number of responsibilities, one of which is to manage 
case load. She, she oversees and makes sure that no one per person has got 300 cases and someone else has 50. 50. So we kind of keep an eye on that stuff. We did, we do dole the case out every day. Um, and we have supervisors that do the, do the doling out of the cases. Obviously, the gravity of the case will dictate to some degree um, which lawyer will be handling it or which group of lawyers will be handling it. Um, Is there a typical case load? Yeah, basically, I would say right now um, our felony people have between 140 to 160 open cases at any given time. And the misdemeanor crowd has between three and 350. Um, those were in compliance with the ABA standards, but about a month ago, the ABA came out with new standards, which honestly, um, it said on low rate felonies, you should only have 60. Well, if that were the case, we'd probably have to hire about 50 more lawyers. I, I'm not a believer that the number, uh, sheer number of cases is, is determinative of how heavy a caseload is. When I first started, if you got charged with a DUI, we'll say, you'd get about a two-page written police report that said, I was, I was on patrol and I saw the car in front of me weaving uh, across the center line. I pulled it over, smelled booze on the, on the driver, had him do the dance, you know, that they have you do, didn't, didn't pass it, and um, took him down. Actually, when I first there, they didn't even have the breath test yet. That's how old I am. <laughs> but um, now, the trial prep on those was read, read the police reports, go talk to your client, say, what do you have to say about this? What, what's your side of the story? Um, and, you know, the client might say, I didn't cross the center line and I didn't have any booze on my breath. So we'd file a motion to suppress and the you know, we'd be in front of the judge and the cop would go up there and say he crossed the center line, he couldn't do the step and walk and jump on your one foot and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And he smelled like alcohol. And the defendant gets up there and said, that's all false. Who do you think the judge is going to believe? All 99.9% .9 of the time. Now, they can't pull some of that crap because uh, there's body cam and cruiser cam. And we've had a number of times when, you know, the, we'll get the report first and it says, oh, he crossed the center line or he didn't turn his blinker on. And we get the cruiser cam and all of a sudden you say, wait a minute, what's that little thing going on and off on the taillight? Mm -hmm. uh, so the reason I bring that up is the, the amount of time that it takes to handle a case of that nature used to be not, you know, maybe three, four, five hours. Now we're talking significantly more because you have to watch all the body cam, all the, all the cruiser cam, and that is very time consuming. Um, okay. So that's one thing. Th to me, to answer your question about the biggest problem on a day-to-day -day basis is the mental health issue. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying any thing that you probably haven't heard, but Douglas County Jail is the biggest mental health hospital probably in the state. Um, we had some statistics from the month of August just passed. And I can tell you that on a daily basis there are between 11 and 1200 people that are incarcerated at the Douglas County Jail. 90, 900 of them out of 1,100, we'll say, are there as pretrial detainees who are unable to post bond. And the Doug County Jail screens people when they come in. And the statistics for August were that 28% of them had SMI, which they define as serious mental illness. I'm talking schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder. And that 40% have a diagnosable mental illness. Well, as you can imagine, trying to deal with clients who are in distre mental health distress is extremely difficult. A lot of times they won't talk to us. Uh, a lot of times they can't communicate with us in any logical fashion. Um, there's a thing called competence to stand trial. 
and some someone might be in there on some very low grade misdemeanor, like like someone got thrown out of Stevens Center or Francis Siena House, and they go back and they call the cops and charge them with trespassing, and they're mentally ill. If you could, if, if, a lot of the times, you could go to the court the next day and say, we'll plead guilty, give us time and cost, and out the door. <coughs> um, but if they're mentally ill and can't communicate with you, ethically you can't get them to enter any kind of plea until they're competent to stand trial. So you, if, the, if they're found incompetent, they are supposed to get sent to the Lincoln Regional Center to restore competence. And in, in truth, with the, with the advances in medicine over my career, a lot of people who suffer from serious mental illness, the meds really work. Um, and they can get them to a point where they can have a rational conversation. It's Probably. predominantly those that come in on criminal charges, though, that have these uh, SMIs or... Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, Folks, I want to kind of interrupt. We only have so much time, and I want to get, if I can, with due respect, I want to get through a few of the questions more for us a little okay. more rapidly. And then I know there's audience members out because I know some of the personalities, they got some questions. So, okay. so we can do kind of like the sound bite conversation a little bit here. I'm not good at that. Yeah, and, 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 so and you we'll, can probably we'll, tell. Put the timer on. Yeah, that, that's what the moderator <laughs> got here, y'all. I got a big timer and a small timer, but what we're going to do is we want to get through a few questions to set the stage okay. as we did. And then we want people to ask all the questions they can because it's rare we get a chance to get. I'm out to do this, so. Just, just let me say one more thing. Okay. On the competency, you have to go to read there. The wait time now is 22 to 26 weeks. So you sit in Douglas County Jail for 22 to 26 weeks before they send you down to the Regional Center for Restoration. That's what I, that's the point I want to make. Good, good, okay. So what I, what I, I have a different kind of question and we kind of just back and forth, but you don't, you're not, hey look who's here. I don't want to front you out, but one of my board members just walked in. I'm not going to mention his name, but anyway. Um, one of the, you, you just mentioned, Tom, that you had eight staff members when you started. You got 50. And one question we'd ask is how many of them are color? And again, when I worked at the county, down at the county government, I saw very few African Americans, yep. Latinos, Asians, Native yep. Americans working yep. in government positions. Yep. So Absolutely. we know that when you have uh, lawyers and attorneys and people of color and institutions, it make it flow better for those respective communities. So I want to yep. ask you the numbers, okay? okay. Yeah. What okay. we got going on here? Right now, right now, we only have one African American lawyer left in the office. Uh, Cameron Mosby. Six, eight months ago, we had four. So what happened? That Corey took a job at t as a teacher. Corey Taylor took a teacher job at law Thank school. Um, Waimanda uh, Summers took a job as a okay. dean. So they went to other places. They moved on. And yes. Okay, guys. Gotcha. Recruiting African American or or minority lawyers is extremely difficult because we our feeders are look Creighton and UNL. I interviewed a young man who was a law student from Lincoln for a clerkship. Uh -huh. And I asked him, I, I said to him, we really want to out reach out to um, African American law students to come and clerk at it. Uh, I'm glad you, you're here. He said, well, I'm the only African-American in my class. You mean in Lincoln? Yeah. The whole college? No, in his class. Oh, class. Okay. So he was a second year student. Okay. We offered him the job, but he... I understand that him. there were six in my class. Six. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's... But let me ask you this, and I know one of the things that OPS did in the early days when we were desegregating the schools is they would uh, recruit at HBCUs. And Some people don't know what that means. So you explain what that HBCUs means. historically black colleges and universities. So OPS would send a team out to those colleges to sell Nebraska. And many came to Nebraska to teach in the system. So I'm wondering, do we do anything like that? Has there been you know, anything that would allow us to go outside of Nebraska for recruitment purposes? And let me hijack that a little bit and say, what kind of outreach do you do, which is related to that? Because I have no clue what outreach, because you said some things that like people like don't said, know what you do. Typically, it's UNL and great. Okay. Um, to answer your question, it's been quite some time, but we, I did reach out 10 years ago, when I think we had no African-American lawyer, um, or maybe TJ Secret was, was there. Was Deborah there then? I, I think she came after. 
Beverly. Um, and we reached out to Howard. Um, and obviously it was long distance and predated Zoom. Um, and really didn't get much, you know, you know the kids in, that were in D.C. weren't too interested in coming to Nebraska. Nebraska's a hard sell. Yeah, it at is. At HBCU, it's a hard <laughs> sell. <laughs> well, we we we, we're not supposed to be laughing at y'all. This is official we, business. We had, the, we had two twins, remember? Um, God, I can't, I can't recall. They were both from Georgia. Um, Alonzo and Alfonso. Yes, yes, yes. Right. What, Whitaker? Is it Whitaker? Whitaker. Yeah, see, I, yes. know, I know people better. Yep. Okay. And uh, <laughs> they both were here for a while and got fed up and went back to, I believe it was Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and it you know, wasn't because they hated us, it was just. They better better opportunities. Push pull. It, it was just so. So, so I was going to take your point and because now we can do some of this stuff by Zoom, maybe we can get somewhere. So, how do you rate the quality of your service? In other words, demographics. If you were comparing Douglas County to another jurisdiction, how do you know if you guys are doing a good thing or bad thing? Do you actually go to a clientele and say, "Was I a good lawyer?" Do you have any kind of survey or quality indicators to okay. know if we're doing good as a, as a public entity? I'm not talking about individual lawyers. I'm talking about the whole system. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, Thank you. I appreciate it. We. Uh, I'm on a bunch of listservs with public defender entities across the country, and we do a lot of Zoom interactions. And um, there have been a number of suggestions on how to how to generate that kind of information in a in an orderly fashion. Typically, the way we make a lot of our decisions is if if. One of our lawyers is getting a lot of complaints about not going to see the client, not communicating with family, that kind of thing. That's a red flag. Um, we don't have a form to fill out and say, are you happy with this or are you unhappy with this? Usually there's no problem with someone saying we're not happy or someone saying, hey man, thanks a million. Um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the cases, um, you know, especially the misdemeanors move, boom, 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 boom. Um, and, you know, that there doesn't seem to me to be a great way to do it. An evaluation. To, to, yeah, to do an evaluation that has has really. Um, Validity, brother. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 all the kind of I've seen, stuff you want. I've seen, uh, no, I've had them send me some, some of the entities that do those kind of things. And some of them did it and stopped doing it um, because they, they found it was time consuming and didn't really get you very far. Um, what we do is we have our supervisory staff. Each of them has a group of lawyers that they supervise. And they, are, they originally, if there's a complaint, they could go to them. We document it in each lawyer's case file, unless it's a, someone who's <coughs> obviously mentally ill and just going off to me. We have plenty of that, but there's not much sense in, in you know, documenting all that stuff. It, where, where, where you want to make some documentation in, in their file is, you know, if you hear the same complaint, the same major complaint, three, four, five times in a relatively short period of time, then it's time to grab them by the ear and say, okay, what the hell's going on here? Um, and, uh, you know, we've had some, in, in some incidents where we've had to do that. Um, and I, uh, you know, I tell them that, that you know, I'm not a person that leans over your shoulder and says, my way or the highway. Um, but we do have a bar. That below the bar. Below, bar. below yeah. which you can't go. I think related to that question, we, we have um, an excess of racism in the system itself. And I think that played out for all of us to see in real time with the Skirlock and, and everything that happened with that, the grand jury and everything that happened with Klein and, and, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to speak with him. So we had that conversation, we were talking about it briefly with the, the guy who wrote the book yeah. and what that looked like in Omaha, Nebraska. And we incarcerate more people in this state, in particular zip codes and neighborhoods 
than a lot of other places across the nation. And for cities that are comparable sizes, more than anybody else. When a lot of that was going on, there was some conversation from some people, and I won't name them, but we know who they are, that said our system is not racist. Uh, I think we are being disingenuous if we say that. Uh, but knowing that it's absolutely true and that occurs in the system, how do you handle that in your office when we know that there's some bias and it's bias from the time of the first police contact, from the arrest, all the way through sentencing? There's bias throughout the system. Well, how does that play out in your office? Well, what, what you have to do is recognize that that is, you know, the elephant in the room, you know, that mental health. And not only in the system by by race, but also by by finance, classes, income. Poor, poor people, poor people do not get the same treatment that wealthy people get. Just look at the bond setting. Um, you know, someone that's white and wealthy get to 5,000, 10% bonds, so they only have to pay 500 bucks. Whereas someone who's African American, someone that doesn't speak English, whether they're from Africa or from Latin America, um, they get higher bonds. Um, and if you're poor, 5,000, 10% bond is like, you might as well be five million. million dollars, yes. Um, yeah. Just a quick question to follow up. Why is that an issue? Just for the audience to understand. Why is having a high bond an issue versus a low bond? And why does that play out in the criminal Well, it, it, obviously, the number one thing we want to do is keep our clients out of jail the best we can. And um, when the judge sets the initial bond, keep in mind, the defense lawyer has no idea what the prosecutors have as, by way of evidence, okay? What will happen at the bond setting in a felony is we'll, we interview every felony detainee every day, 365 days a year. We interview all of them, unless they say, I don't want to talk to both defendants. Um, and we get name, rank, serial number, where do you live, how long you been here, all the things that are germane to bond. Um, prior record, of course, um, have you ever been charged with failure to appear, things like that. Um, we now have a pre-trial, a newer pre-trial release program that has limited some of the, um, what I thought would be, were, were biased both by race and by class. Um, and some of those questions were eliminated. They have a score. They've always had a score. Now they take have a different assessment tool that is more beneficial. These are the questions that the judges ask from the bench. These are the judges that uh, these are the questions that are handled by the pretrial release people okay. who get the information um, and provide it to the judge. Okay, they give them a score. Um, and any anybody that's charged with a crime can tell you that it's a hell of a lot easier to defend it if you're out on bond than if you're sitting in jail. Uh, your ability to communicate with people is minimal. You can't talk to your parents or your loved ones because they're recording everything you say. Um, what about lawyer confidentiality? Don't they have an option not to record you if you're they, a lawyer? They, they, they won't record us. Okay, so it's But if, if, I'm, if I'm sitting in jail and uh, my lawyer comes and tells me, hey, you're charged with uh, second-degree murder, which carries 20 to life, and they're willing to drop it down to a manslaughter, which is 1 to 20. My lawyer, if they're doing the right thing, says, ask me whatever questions you want, and I'll tell you um, what I think. And, but the decision, whether to plea or not plea, is entirely with the client. If I'm out on bond, I can have a conversation with my loved ones and say, here's what happened, here's what I need to do, what do you think we should do? If you're in jail, you can't do that because they're recording everything you do. Now they have tablets down there, the cops have access to everything, that, any of the emails that are going back and forth, the text messages are going back and forth. 
on the, on the video visits, they record all of that. So you have absolutely no opportunity <coughs> to speak with friends, loved ones about the case. So tell me to interrupt, because the question is, why is the bond high and low for certain people? Is that a judge decision? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. it could be pointing back to the judge being biased or racist or whatever, it basically is the answer to that question, well, right? And we don't have any empirical data in Douglas County that shows these disparities of income or race or class or like that, right? We don't, I don't know that there's any data to tell. I can tell you that every day on felonies, um, we have a sheet with everyone's name and what they're charged with and what their bond is and what their score was. And, you know, some judges, the bonds are reasonable. And some are not. Other judges, not so much. This is study for the university. But reasonable somewhere. is relative. <laughs> absolutely. That, that's absolutely relative. Because if you're poor and if you're black and you're in jail and you get a bond and it's only $500 and you can't make the bond, and guess what? You lose your job. Right. You lose your so housing. Uh, you yep. lose your housing yep. and everything absolutely. else. So you kind of SOL. Yeah, so you can't we, be. We're going to get ready to throw it off to the audience because we're ready at that time. I'm okay. a timekeeper, remember that. So <laughs> maybe one last question on your character, and then I have one, and then we'll throw it out because we want to bring people into this conversation so it's not a dialogue between the three of us. Okay. Um, so I believe in the last legislative session, uh, there was an attempt to bring um, some legislation regarding getting rid of cash bail. I know they've done it in California already. That would allow um, that disparity to be addressed in one small way if there was no cash bond. If there was a presumption of release for whatever reason that you are arrested, unless there's a reason not to, safety issue, flight issue, whatever. Yep. If we had a presumption of release in Douglas County, I think that would address that issue. Did you testify on that bill at all? Uh, or what? what is your take on it? would you testify? Our organization testified on it. Okay. I, that was not one I was uh, able to get down there on. But um, th there was a statute passed several years ago that is, I think, being pretty ignored. And that is, the statute says basically that the judge has to take into account when they're setting the bond, the person's ability to pay. And what I talked about earlier, you know, if, you, if you're a rich guy and you have a 5,000 10 percent bond, you know, by the time you're going back to yourself, they've already got the money, they say roll up and go. Whereas <laughs> that's not the case with, with um, people that, a lot of people that we have in our office. Um, so whose I, responsibility is that to bring that to the attention of the judge? Is we that do. defense counsel? Yeah, we do. Okay. We do. And I said, so, you know, they'll nod their head and say, yes, I understand that. Um, you know, the, you know, the no cash bond, I think, would work on lower grade offenses. Obviously, when you're talking about homicide, drive-bys, sexual assaults, that's probably not realistic. Mm -hmm. um, but there could certainly be some criteria um, that would be set where if these criteria are met, you get security release. Sure. Um, Folks, I'm going to simply switch up. I'm going to ask one last question. I'm going to throw it out to the audience. And I'm going to try to be a moderator a little bit better so that we can get as many questions, feedback in, because it's a rare occasion where we've got a uh, time out like this. My last question is, and, and I'm alluding to, you alluded to earlier, race you spent like this, in the specific amount of time talking about African Americans. I'm also talking about the recent Sudanese in our community, Spanish speaking people, so on. Two part question. One is, do you have any Hispanic or Latino? attorneys or people from other parts of the world on your staff? And then two, how do you deal with that language issue? Because I've heard there's some people who've come to our community who don't speak English that well, and they go to the court system, the system can baffle them and treat them well. And so if you can kind of keep it briefly, so I can throw it back out the eyes, but just give us a little bit of overview. Are there any Latinos or other racial groups on your staff? Because I know you look to African Americans, but all you know got to ask those tough questions. Okay. Um, we have four lawyers that speak Spanish. Okay, good. And we have Two investigators out of our four that speak Spanish. We have one, two, three, four of uh, four secretarial that speak Spanish. Okay. So we've got Spanish covered. So how do you have the language in other languages? Um, when it comes to other languages, then that becomes a bit of a problem. The uh, the there is an entity out there that by Zoom the court will uh, hire to translate for like newer 
okay, um, some, some, of the, some of the more exotic languages that are relatively newer, newly introduced into the community. Uh, we do have a significant number of clients who are uh, from South Sudan, mm -hmm. uh, who are refugees, um, and the younger they are, the more likely they are to speak English. Um, many of their parents do not. Um, mercifully, they may have a relative or a child that does speak both languages, and we can get some communication through it. But there, you know, that's that's an ongoing issue. Um, but Spanish, we got. Okay, gotcha. You were a certain eye. I've been watching all y'all. So anybody got any questions, I might worry about that. But I see two hands go. Jack, let go over here and I'll try to keep track of your fingers up like an octopus. So Jack, you first. Just a quick question. I, my understanding is that cell phones can instantly translate from many languages to English. Is there, is there any thought of using that? Um, I, I have not heard of that being used. Like I said, I'm on a lot of these. Boards and commissions. Uh, public defender slash defense lawyer um, meetings, uh, and I, I haven't heard of that one yet. Um, I'd have to think about what the pros and cons of that would be. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I first started, I, I I had like seven years of Spanish, and I I could at least get name, rank, and serial number out. But I'll tell you, once we hire Spanish speakers, you could just see the the faces light up and how much better it was. Um, if, when, like I said, when we interview people uh, all 365 days a year, um, sometimes the lawyer that we've got there on that day doesn't speak Espanol. So I tell them, get, get to the, the Google and you can get where do you live and you know, what's your phone number and what are you charged with. You can get that out and at least let them know you're going to court you know, on Tuesday, you're going to court on Wednesday, and so they're not just uh, SOL. Um, so I encourage the lawyer to do that. Sometimes they, they chicken out because um, they're afraid. But, um, that, yeah, that's something that we can look into. We'll follow up on that. Ma'am, you have the next question. Yes, so I, I heard you talking about the um, high number of people who deal with mental illness that are incarcerated. Um, working in public service, I've worked in some places where there are a lot of people sent to um, a co-occurring facility generally for um, addiction and mental illness yeah. from the courts and the courts will pay for it and everything. The majority of those people sent to those facilities are white males when I know there are a ton <coughs> of people in this community right here that have those same disabilities, how is that gauged? It, it, the, the sad reality is, is the entity can, can decide who they're gonna take and who they're not. Courts can't order, the, order a, a private entity to take someone as a client. Um, that's why we need the state to step up and get some community-based Facilities like so that. What I'm talking about is generally because it's the um, Center Point Campus for Hope, so they pretty much take anybody. Mm -hmm. And it's still the majority of the clients that come in from the court system. I'm just wondering why more minorities are not getting the same opportunities that these white males are getting. That, I don't know the answer. Well, we threw it out in the public arena, so hopefully we'll have somebody to follow up on that and Thank deal with it. Because again, that's what these events are about is bring light to issues of disparities and issues. Like a lot of that is going to rest again with defense counsel at the bench when you were pitching it for your client. Okay. You should have had those conversations already ahead of time, making contacts, see if they have a bed available, and then have that conversation at the bench with the judge. Judge, there's a bed here at this facility. But again, the facility is going to have to accept the person. Mm -hmm. So if defense counsel is doing their job on the front end of that, by the time you get in front of the judge to have the conversation, you already know if there's a bed, they already know your client's background, they know whether or not there's a good fit, because a lot of times they won't take them if they have certain other types of crimes that are associated yeah. with that person. Yeah. So it's a whole host of things that go yeah. into that. We have a social services coordinator in our office who is in contact with all of the entities and does exactly what you're talking about. Uh, what's the name of the entity you're talking about? Campus for Hope, um, okay. I think it's Center Point. I'll, I'll find out yeah. okay. from the, from 
per what, what the score is at that place. Okay. Other questions out there? I see one already in the back. That's two, but go here and then come over here. Yes. Yeah, I got two. The first one is just real source. We okay. Just point. Uh, have you ever seen people sent to Lincoln? You talk about competency advisors. And uh, have you seen people sent there before on misdemeanor for competency evaluations? Have I seen people what? Sent to Lincoln to the regional center for competency evaluations on misdemeanor charges. For misdemeanors? Yes. Rare, but sometimes. But you have seen it? Yes. And they also recently passed the law to allow for outpatient restoration. So someone who's a, a misdemeanor, charged with a misdemeanor, would be a good option for, as an outpatient um, uh, restoration. Problem once again is service providers trying to find someone. People in the mental health profession don't want to do forensics much anymore. Uh, again, I don't want to be too much of a historian, but we used to have four, five, six forensic psychiatrists that would do evals for us all the time. We're down to like one or two. Um, so say, hey, I got to have my client eval for mental health. Okay, well I'll see him in about four weeks. You know, that's that's. Totally. You had a follow-up question? I saw you had two uh, written down there. Yeah, the other part was, um, okay, when you talk about bail being used in a punitive manner and potentially inhibiting somebody's ability to provide themselves a defense, you talk about potential Eighth Amendment violations. So does your office take any kind of civil action in that regard for your clients? Like, I just, well, can I, can I just... Uh, don't go too long winded, bro, now. But don't go too long winded. Okay, can I just premise it, though? I was in court one time, and uh, you know, you go to the bathroom and you miss the roll call. You might sit in court from 9:15 till 11 o'clock. I had a, a, a ticket for a driving infraction, and I was going to contest it. And they came up to me and they said, at 11 o'clock, they said, "Who are you?" And I said, "You haven't called my name yet." And they said, "We already called you, and uh, we'll give you a, we'll let you go ahead and, and just plead this out and we'll drop the failure to appear." So you're talking about failure to appear as a fitness bonds but sometimes you can get a fair to appear when you're in the courtroom oh, you know? yeah yeah you could be there at nine o'clock but if yep. you're there at like they call your name or something most people don't know that yeah yes. so you can be right there in the yep. courtroom and get yes. one on the spot yep. and then the other question i, I mean I've, I've also had somebody call me before he was in blair and he said you know i'm trying to get bonded out and he said i need twenty dollars and i said twenty dollars you're just sitting out fines you'll be out tomorrow and he said, no, they won't let me go. And so I called back and I talked to the jailer. They said, hey, two months, this guy can sit here for his 20 bucks. We're not going to let him go. In Blair, Nebraska? Is, yeah, this is in Blair, Nebraska, in Washington County. And he said it was a $20 bond. And so that would seem punitive to me. Should his lawyer have filed something on his behalf? Well, first of all, the thing you talked about, about going to the bathroom and then having your name called, that, that's a sad reality. Don't forget, in misdemeanor cases, we can't get involved until the court appoints us. And if that's your first appearance, you know. But you can go against your bond, that's all I'm saying. So, Say what? But you can go against your future bonds. You yeah, yeah, absolutely you can. Right? And, you know, but that's the kind of thing that if you, when you get your lawyer, you tell them this is what happened, and you tell the judge that. And if you have a judge that isn't a total cynic, you might be able to, I, I know there's certain judges that used to pull that crap all the time, Larry Barrett being one. Um, and some others have done that. It, it's very cynical and, and it's unfair. Uh, the Blair thing, you got me on that one I, out of my jurisdiction. And we may have to follow up on something like that. There was another question on the floor. I saw, there, was it, there, I mean, I was, okay, you're next and then we go there. Okay, gotcha. Oh. Yeah, so how much, uh, I don't want to say legitimacy, I guess how much effort and then being that it's like public defender, what is the, what's the reality on like a bond reduction, right? So like we're talking about bonds and everything, ability to do this, that, and third. So, yeah. you know, yeah. like what, talk to me about that. Basically like, what, if you, if you get a bond that's too high and you can't make it, you have a right to a bond review. And if it's a misdemeanor, most of the judges will give you a bond review about two weeks down the road and will insist that there must be a change in circumstance from when you originally had your bond set, which is, in my opinion, kind of ridiculous. Now, I can't say that that's true about every single judge, but that's the broad rule. On felonies, the county court judges set the bonds originally on felonies, and they have a tendency to set them high. 
Um, if the case gets bound over either by a waiver of the prelim or after a preliminary hearing, it goes to district court. We do have some success with the district court judges to have a bond review. The sad reality though is if you had a, if you have a preliminary hearing, that happens four to six weeks after your original arraignment on a felony. So you're sitting there for four to six weeks. You know, if I go in front of the same judge, he's gonna say, well, what, what's different from what, what the original bond was? And say, well, what's different is he's been sitting here for 40 days, he lost his house, uh, he's gonna, he can't pay child support, he's gonna lose his job. That's different, okay? Um, and that rings true with some judges and it's, too bad, so sad with others, unfortunately. Wow. There's another question back here. Can Please. I respond briefly to okay. just very briefly? Okay, good. Um, that's why uh, when, when Tom talked about how we recalibrated the law of Nebraska, where it should be based on your ability to pay, that's in the statute now. And although many judges kind of look the other way, it's defense counsel's responsibility at the bench to have that conversation and fight for you based on what the statute says. Gotcha. They always did. Okay, so since judges are on the ballot every couple years, uh, whether or not they want to be retained, it seems to me that as taxpayers, we should be able to create some type of oversight committee to determine whether or not these judges are making the proper rulings in court prior to the election so that we can put a report card out on them as to whether or not they're failing the system. Well, I can tell you that the Bar Association, before every election, um, the Bar Association is sent a questionnaire mm -hmm. and asked a bunch of questions about the judge's fairness, uh, wisdom, blah, 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 blah. And the question, final question is, do you think this judge should be retained or not? And it's anonymous, they say. Um, and I can tell you that there are a number of judges who a majority of the lawyers that practice in front of them said, this judge should not be retained. And that information is available to the public, but as we all know, sad reality is that, you know, the voting public is busy with other stuff. Um, and knowledge is power. If, if, you know, if they saw that some of these judges have historically, continuously been graded by the lawyer that in front of them, and I'm not talking about 10 lawyers, we're talking about hundreds of lawyers. And if they, you know, 30% say they should be retained and 70% say they should be thrown out, that should be a pretty good method to the voting public that this judge, for a variety of reasons, shouldn't be retained. Um, but that has happened. I would say Douglas County more so than prison. I not, do not. I know. Interpret I'm always thing. thinking because I think, well, if they convicted, if they're not going to the regional center, they're going to prison. That's right. That's right. And I, I just, the number of people that are in the Douglas County Jail are mostly pre adjudication. And a lot of them, although it takes way too long, do not get sent to prison. They end up being. Um, on misdemeanors if they didn't read the law, but they have to get released because they've served more time in the regional center than would have got if they got sentenced. Um, and in many cases, once a person is restored to competence, and as long as it's not a murder or a sexual assault, there, there's a lot of mitigating factors there, and some of the judges will give someone probation as opposed to sending them to prison because of the, the one of the catalysts to committing the offense was the, the mental illness. So um, I do think that, especially in the rural areas, where maybe they don't have quite as much um, amount of the, the amount of lawyers that are going to be hard nosed about this, they may may be going down there. But I, I, I you, you might be right, but I think it's a close call. Well, my thing, I, I'm kind of like an advocate for the for the residents there in prison when they leave it. I unfortunately been there twice, and there's a, a mental piece. That, that comes with being locked up in like a like an animal, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's been if, uh, the emphasis is not on it so much, and then you wonder why the recidivism rate is so high, and everything else that goes with it is happening mostly in brown and black communities, and it's not so we just getting a cycle, generational cycles of saying the same thing, and it's keeping the jobs intact, keeping 
the corrections officers can build a new prisons and all that stuff. So, the, the, you know, the, um, <coughs> the, the way they're doing things in prison now, you know, in Nebraska, when you get sentenced to prison, they'll say, if not less than three or more than five years, no part of which you'll be in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is torture, clear and simple. I have clients who, some of whom I haven't spoken to in years that are down there doing some time, they'll call me and say, hey, Tom, I'm just, they put me in the Supermax prison that they just built um, at LCC, and we're, in, we're locked up for 23 out of 24 hours a day. We can't communicate with anyone else except the guards. Get me the hell out of here. And that goes to what Terry and I were talking about earlier, about the inspector general who was, is very, very good, and the, and the um, ombudsman's office have been very good about getting to the bottom of things and sometimes reversing those classifications. Um, now they've neutered that, uh, that entity. The attorney general said that it's unconstitutional and has informed the prison not to let the ombudsman or the inspector general have access to all the data that was causing reclassification. Can't, they, they can't visit the prisoners whenever they want to, which they previously had the ability to do. Now they have to do it like your visitor. Uh, so they, they cut them off at the knees and there's gotta be some, hopefully there's some legal action taken to reinstate that oversight because that office has done a tremendous, tremendous amount of positive work to expose a lot of the bad stuff that's going on in the prison. We have another question. Before we get to the question, I want to throw something out at you. You alluded to it earlier, but you went to specific. If I'm committed, if I commit a crime and I need your services, what's my income limit to get your services? In other words, can I be a middle income person and still get your services? Can you say there was yeah. an exception, so, so give me a ballpark number. I, I, I can qualify to get your services. Not that I'm going to commit a crime, but Basically, what, what income range do you serve is what I'm asking. Or, or, or just in general. Right. What, what's the income range? I have no clue. There, there's no income range. The, the statute simply says if, if you are unable to provide yourself and your family with the basic necessities of life, you're entitled to counsel. Obviously, as I said earlier, a lot of that depends on the nature of the offense. If you're charged with a high-grade high felony, you're going to have a high bond, you're likely going to be staying in jail, and the judge is going to appoint us. The judge, in their in their thinking, obviously will say, well, if this person has enough money to hire their own attorney, they're likely going to do it anyway. Mm. Um, whether that's true or not is debatable. Um, but, I mean, just for the hell of it, sometime, call a, call a private criminal defense lawyer and say, hey, my loved one is charged with... Uh, a drive-by shooting, how much will it cost? Call mm. Leffler. Yeah. What, what are we talking about? I have no clue. What are we talking about? 30 grand. 30 grand? If you're trying to tell you, if you're trying to start, if you're trying to start, to retain, to keep going. Go okay. The reporter has a question. We want to give the perfect attention. How much discretion is there in that statue with what the judge, like, has the judge ever deprived someone of counsel because they say, they can pay for the Sometimes they'll say, um, I'm not going to appoint the public defender. I don't think you're indigent. Um, and then the guy will come back a week later and say, I tried, I can't. And the judge will usually say, all right, I, I want the case to at least move. So we'll appoint the public defender. Total discretion with the judge. Um, and for better or worse. We got three questions on the phone. We're here, here, and here. OK, first judge. I only wanted to say, you're not entitled public counsel if you're a parent charged with a 3A or if you're in a 3A. I don't know what a 3A means. You help oh, yes, you are. Yes, you, yes, you are. We represent people charged with 3A that are accused of parental, law, living their parental rights on 3A. What, we what, what a 3A help me, y'all? Help me. Yeah, basically, it's a it's attempt by the state to deprive you of your parental rights. So gotcha. we've, okay. docu we've documented this. We've gone through the court system, and you're not entitled to an attorney. Well, if you're wrong. Well, we'll pursue that a little bit later. Good, good. Well, I had another question. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, bro. We're going to pass the love around here. We, we, it's not a private conversation. I'm saying in Douglas County, you're wrong. But he's available yeah. afterwards, so we can do that. Go here. In Douglas County, you're wrong. we got two more questions here. It's a top dog, right? 
Yeah, just a question for maybe to kind of switch the conversation a bit. What is the temperature of the prosecutor's office? And what I mean by that is, um, I generally think there's two types of prosecutor's office. Um, one that tries to get it right, and one that tries to get convictions at all costs. Even at the cost of um, maybe holding on to evidence that may sculpt the uh, defendant. So I guess what is your general uh, I guess feedback on that as your experience working with the prosecutors? I would those? say that in the earlier part of my career, there were prosecutors who would withhold evidence um, from defense counsel. Um, I would say that in the last 15 plus years, that has not been my experience. And the reason is that it's too hard to, to, to hide it. It's just too hard to hide it. There's way too many ways that we can find out, um, hey, wait a minute, where is this? Now, I, I will say that sometimes it comes late, uh, which is very frustrating. Um, so, I, w I would be a liar if I said that I believe that the current group of prosecutors withhold evidence from defense counsel, especially exculpatory evidence from defense counsel. They they give us all of the all of the discovery materials. We've got videos of all the witnesses, um, and and you know if you are reading if you're experienced enough and you're reading some reports and you say wait a minute where did, how did they get from point A to point B the then you start asking questions sometimes you know prosecutors can only give us what they get from the cops that can be a different story okay um, if the police decide they're not going to give something to the county attorney's office and I've had a couple of cases where that were pretty high profile where uh, witnesses in a murder case, we didn't get their interviews because the police officer forgot to put it, book it into evidence. They, they went and found it and, and it was on the floor, you remember that? Um, there was, it, was, it was ridiculous. Now whether or not it was intentional, it kind of is irrelevant, isn't it? I mean, the fact is we don't have it. Um, and you know, we were able to expose that um, and you'd like to think that police don't like getting embarrassed by public defenders. Um, so they take some steps to avoid that. Yeah. Um, so. Can I kind of relate it to this just? Okay. okay. Real quick. Um, I think related to your question is um, how prosecutors stack charges on the front end, which really forces your client basically into a plea. Yeah. How does the public defender's office, um, or, or do you think that certain prosecutors are amenable to not do that front end stacking? Okay, that, that's a, a question that probably is, has an answer that's variable to the prosecutor who's handling it. Um, do I think that sometimes cases are severely overcharged? Yes. Ask yourself, why is that? Is it because the, the prosecutor didn't read all the material before they filed the charges? Um, I, I think a lot of times that happens. So that they'll, they'll charge them whatever the cops book them in on. Then after we get the discovery and they say, are you kidding me? And, you know, this, this is ridiculous. This is way overcharged. Uh, if you have a reasonable prosecutor, you, you may get some, get them headway but if your if your client asserts his innocence or her uh, a lot of times they'll say well if you're going to go to trial you're going to go to trial on everything um, and if you want to enter a plea maybe I'll reduce this to what you think is the appropriate charge so it does put uh, an accused person in a, in a kind of a kept 22 position um, I, I think that there there are definitely people who are doing prison time for an offense that either was overcharged or they didn't commit, but, but they didn't want to roll the dice and face 100 years in prison if they could get two. Wow. Do I think that's fair? No. Yeah, that's kind of a little something about the wrongful convictions rates. Is there any stats on that? Um, for Nebraska? For Nebraska. And 
I'm pers- I mean, it personally affected me in 1989. I was wrongfully convicted during the, uh, the crack era. And that led me at the age of 17, they gave me five years with no priors or nothing. And it was uh, primarily because the attack on black and brown poor people and I got five years for it. standing there in, in, in the projects. And the police ran up on me and said, uh, I was the one and when I went to trial six months later, the undercover said to the best of my knowledge, it was me. I didn't have no marked bills or nothing, no evidence saying so. And they found me guilty in the age of 17, 75 years and that turned me into something I wasn't after prison. Yeah, you know, um, one, of the, one of the other real problems is uh, how, many, and, and, how, and many, how many minority people were on your jury? One. That the miracle. Yeah. And then before that, even before that, I had, uh, because I had a co-defendant, uh, I had an outside, James Reagan, he's still down there. Um, when we was picking the jury, we had a white, a white lady break down and said, I hate drug dealers, my son or daughter OB. That right then, the, the, the thing should have been scratched. I think he might have made a motion to do that, but it, they didn't. You know, just they, they was on a mission to take me or anybody to prison. They didn't care about the name, they wanted the bodies to keep filling the prisons up. Mm. Sure. So uh, mm. that's what that's kind of like my source. I'm really passionate about wrongful conviction and stuff like that. Sure. Other questions, other feedbacks, folks. Any other, anybody else who's been quiet and want to say something? Anyone? Anyone? Because we have no problems with doing an audible and closing out early. Any other comments? Yes, ma'am. I, just since he brought that up, so why? Because I've seen several, and I've never been asked to be on the jury for yeah. anything. And I'm a registered voter, driver's license, all right. that. I've been here all my life. I've never been on the jury either. Never. I don't want to be on the jury. I want to be one. Me too. I do too. But they never got me. They, never. And so, yeah. they're always one time. Every I want to be on the jury so bad. It's bucket list. Okay, well, let me let me tell you. Every jury, like, like, you see you all this you. pool of mixed people, a mixture of people, and then the jury ends up being all white. Yes, I've, I've dealt with that frequently. So and how do we address that then? How can we what we're that? doing right now is I've been in contact with the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. They got a, a grant to help us get data to allow it to challenge the. Uh, jury pools. We have no data. In Douglas uh, County. See, if, if you have a, when you get your summons for jury duty, there's a, a section at the bottom, and this is a relatively new, and it says race or ethnicity, but it's optional. So a lot of people don't answer the question. So this, this group, um, there are two lawyers from Drake University that I've been in contact with. Um, and they were able to get some court rule changes and also some litigation that in their mind has significantly increased the likelihood of, of a better fair cross-section of jurors. I'm hoping that with their help and with this grant that we'll get somewhere. We've contacted the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. We've contacted some other members of the court and we're planning on a uh, Forum in December, uh, and then another one with Judge Spencer after that. Don't put that. There's another question here. I'm, so I'm, I'm picking popcorn. When when I was the election commissioner here in Douglas County, normally the jury came from a list of registered voters in Douglas County. Right. I know that. Time can make uh, someone who's calling potential uh, uh, individuals to be on the, uh, that can get kind of lazy and they begin to relay or rely on just a certain number and group of people who have been uh, uh, called several times. I would imagine that we should be looking at how many times those individuals have been called to be on a jury uh, as to whether or not they're trying to include or be more inclusive for juries. Yeah, so, 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 a little different. Are you saying there are people who are constantly on juries? I mean, other people are excluded from juries? I, I think that's what we need to investigate. And we have no data on that. Is that what you're hearing? Not that I'm aware of. I could tell you that the clerk of district court now is the jury commissioner. Okay. And as was related earlier, the 
um, jury pool had, was expanded statutorily from registered voters to been added if you have a driver's license. Um, so that's the jury pool. They have a what they claim to be a computer program that anonymously or randomly picks who the jurors are. But you're right. I would say Douglas County more so than prison. I not, do not I know, interpret what I'm always thinking because I think, well, if they convict it, if they're not going to the regional center, they're going to prison. That's right. That's right. And, and I, I just, the number of people that are in Douglas County Jail are mostly pre adjudication, and a lot of them, although it takes way too long, do not get sent to prison. They end up being. Um, on misdemeanors if they didn't read the center law, but they have to get released because they've served more time in the regional center than would have got if they got sentenced. Um, and in many cases, once a person is restored to competence, and as long as it's not a murder or a sexual assault, there, there's a lot of mitigating factors there, and some of the judges will give someone probation as opposed to sending them to prison because of the, the one of the catalysts to committing the offense was the, the mental illness. So um, I do think that, especially in the rural areas, where maybe they don't have quite as much um, amount of the, the amount of lawyers that are going to be hard nosed about this, they may may be going down there. But I, I, I you, you might be right, but I think it's a close call. Well, my thing, I, I'm kind of like an advocate for the for the residents there in prison when they leave it. I unfortunately been there twice, and there's a, a mental piece. That, that comes with being locked up in like a like an animal, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's being if, uh, the emphasis is not on it so much, and then you wonder why the recidivism rate is so high, and everything else that goes with it is happening mostly in brown and black communities, and it's not so we just getting a cycle of generational cycles of saying the same thing, and it's keeping the jobs intact, keeping the corrections offers, building new prisons, and all that stuff. So if, if, you know the. Um, <laughs> The, the way they're doing things in prison now, you know, in Nebraska, when you get sentenced to prison, they'll say, if not less than three or more than five years, no part of which you'll be in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is torture, clear and simple. I have clients who, some of whom I haven't spoken to in years that are down there doing some time, they'll call me and say, hey, Tom, I'm, they put me in this supermax prison that they just built. Um, at LCC, and we're in, we're locked up for 23 out of 24 hours a day. We can't communicate with anyone else except the guards. Get me the hell out of here. And that goes to what Terry and I were talking about earlier about the Inspector General, who was is very very good, and the, and the um, Ombudsman's Office have been very good about getting to the bottom of things and sometimes reversing those classifications. Um, now they neutered that uh, that entity. The attorney general said that it's unconstitutional and has informed the prison not to let the ombudsman or the inspector general have access to all the data that was causing reclassification. Can't, they they can't visit the prisoners whenever they want to, which they previously had the ability to do. Now they have to do it like your visitor. Uh, so they, they cut them off at the knees and there's gotta be some, hopefully there's some legal action taken to reinstate that oversight because that office has done a tremendous, tremendous amount of positive work to expose a lot of the bad stuff that's going on in the prison. We had another question. Before we get to the question, I want to throw something out at you. You alluded to it earlier, but you went to specific. If I'm committed, if I commit a crime and I need your services, what's my income limit to get your services? In other words, can I be a middle income person and still get your services? Can you said there was yeah. exception, so, so give me a ballpark number. I, I, I can qualify to get your services. Not that I'm going to commit a crime, but basically, what, what income range do you serve? Is what I'm asking. Or, or, or just in general. Right. What, what's the income rate? I'm clue. There, there's no income rate. The, the statute simply says if, if you are unable to provide yourself and your family with the basic necessities of life, you're entitled to counsel. Obviously, as I said earlier, a lot of 
that depends on the nature of the offense. If you're charged with a high, high grade felony, you're going to have a high bond. You're likely going to be staying in jail, and the judge is going to appoint us. The judge, in their in their thinking, obviously will say, well, if this person has enough money to hire their own attorney, they're likely going to do it anyway. Mm. Um, whether that's true or not is debatable, um, but I mean, just for the hell of it, sometime. Call a call a private criminal defense lawyer and say, "Hey, my loved one is charged with uh, a drive-by shooting. How much will it cost?" Mm -hmm. Call Leffler. Yeah. What, are we, what are we talking? I have no clue. What are we talking? Thirty grand. Thirty grand. If you're trying to tell you, if you take the start, you take the start to retain to keep going. Okay. Rudy has a question. We want to give the perfect attention. How much discretion is there in that statue? with what the judge, like has the judge ever deprived someone of counsel because they say they can pay for the service? Sometimes they'll say, um, I'm not gonna appoint the public defender, I don't think you're indigent. Um, and then the guy will come back a week later and say, I tried, I can't, and the judge will usually say, all right, I, I want the case to at least move, so we'll appoint the public defender. Total discretion with the judge, um, and for better or worse. We got three questions on the phone. We're here, here, and here. Okay, first judge. I only wanted to say you're not entitled to public counsel if you're a parent charged with a 3A or if you're in a 3A. I don't know what a 3A means. Yeah, you are. Yes, you are. We represent people charged with 3A that are accused of parental law, living in parental rights on 3A. We what a 3A help me, y'all? Help me. Basically, it's a attempt by the state to deprive you of your parental rights. Gotcha. Documented this, we've gone through the court system, and you're not entitled to an attorney. Well, if you're wrong. Do an opera scene. We'll, 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 we'll pursue that a little bit later. Good, good. Well, I had another question. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, bro. We gotta pass the love around here. We, we, it's not a private conversation. I'm saying in Douglas County, you're wrong. But he's available yeah. afterwards, so we can do that. Go here. Douglas County, you're wrong. We got two more questions here. It's top go, right? Yeah, just a question for maybe to kind of switch the conversation a bit. What is the temperature of the prosecutor's office? And what I mean by that is. Um, I generally see there's two types of prosecutor's office. Um, one that tries to get it right, and one that tries to get convictions at all costs. Even at the cost of um, maybe holding on to evidence that may sculpt the uh, defendant. So I guess what is your general uh, I guess feedback on that as your experience working with the prosecutor? I would say that in the earlier part of my career, there were prosecutors who would withhold evidence um, from defense counsel. Um, I would say that in the last 15 plus years, that has not been my experience. And the reason is that it's too hard to, to, to hide it. It's just too hard to hide it. There's, way too many ways that we can find out, um, hey, wait a minute, where is this? Now, I, I will say that sometimes it comes late, uh, which is very frustrating. Um, so I, I would be a liar if I said that I believe that the current group of prosecutors withhold evidence from defense counsel, especially exculpatory evidence from defense counsel. They, they give us all of, the, all of the discovery materials We've got videos of all the witnesses, um, and and you know if you are reading, if you're experienced enough and you're reading some reports and you say, wait a minute, where did, how did they get from point A to point B? The then you start asking questions. Sometimes you know prosecutors can only give us what they get from the cops. That can be a different story. Okay. Um, if the police decide they're not going to give something to the county attorney's office, and I've had a couple of cases where that were pretty high profile, where uh, witnesses in a murder case, we didn't get their interviews because the police officer forgot to put it, book it into evidence. They, they went and found it, and, and it was on the floor. You remember that? Um, there was, it was, it was ridiculous. Now, whether or not it was intentional, it kind of is irrelevant, isn't it? I mean, the fact is we don't have it. Um, and, you know, we were able to expose that. Um, and 
you'd like to think that police don't like getting embarrassed by public defenders. Um, so they take some steps to avoid that. Yeah. Um, so Can I kind of relate it to this just okay. Okay. Really, okay. Um, I think related to your question is um, how prosecutors stack charges on the front end, which really forces your client basically into a plea. Yeah. How does the public defender's office um, or, or do you think that certain prosecutors are amenable to not do that front end stacking? Okay, that, that's a, a question that probably is, has an answer that's variable to the prosecutors who handling it. Um, do I think that sometimes cases are severely overcharged? Yes. Ask yourself, why is that? Is it because the, the prosecutor didn't read all the material before they filed the charges? Um, I, I think a lot of times that happens. So that they'll, they'll charge them whatever the cops book them in on. Then after we get the discovery and they are you kidding me? You know, this, this is ridiculous. This is way overcharged. Uh, if you have a reasonable prosecutor, you, you may get some, get them headway but if your if your client asserts his innocence or her uh, a lot of times they'll say well if you're going to go to trial you're going to go to trial on everything um, and if you want to enter a plea maybe I'll reduce this to what you think is the appropriate charge so it does put uh, an accused person in a, in a kind of a kept 22 position um, I, I think that there there are definitely people who are doing prison time for an offense that either was overcharged or they didn't commit, but, but they didn't want to roll the dice and face 100 years in prison if they could get two. Wow. Do I think that's fair? No. Well, yeah, that's kind of a little, I was talking about the wrongful convictions rates. Is there any stats on that? Uh, for Nebraska? For Nebraska. And Not that world. I, pers I mean, it personally affected me in 1989. I was wrongfully convicted during the, uh, the crack era. And that led me at the age of 17, they gave me five years with no priors or nothing. And it was uh, primarily because the attack on black and brown poor people and I got five years for it. Standing there in, in, in the projects and the police ran up on me said, uh, I was one and when I went to trial six months later, the undercover said to the best of my knowledge, it was me. I didn't have no marked bills or nothing, no evidence saying so. And they found me guilty in the age of 17, 75 years and that turned me into something I wasn't after prison. <clears throat> yeah, well, you know, um, one of the one of the other real problems is uh, how many and, 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 uh, and how many how many minority people were on your jury? One. That's a uh, miracle. One. Yeah. And then before that, even before that, I had uh, because I co-defended, uh, I had an outside James Reagan, he's still down there. Uh, when we was picking the jury, we had a white a white lady break down and said I hate drug dealers. My son or daughter OB. That right then, the, the, the thing should have been scratched. I think he might have made a motion to do that, but it, they didn't. You know, just they, they was on a mission to take me or anybody to prison. They didn't care about the name. They wanted the bodies to keep filling the prisons up. Mm -hmm. sure. So uh, mm -hmm. that's what that's kind of like my source. I'm really passionate about wrongful convictions and stuff like that. Sure. Other questions, other feedbacks, folks. Any other? Anybody else who's been quiet who want to say something? Anyone? Anyone? Because we have no problems with doing an audible and closing out early. Any other comments? Yes, ma'am. Just since he brought that up, so why? Because I've seen several, and I've never been asked to be on the jury for yeah. anything. And I'm a registered voter, driver's yeah. license. Right. I've that. been here all my Not life. I've never been on the jury either. Never. I don't want to be on the jury. I want to be one. Me but, too. I do too. But they never got me. They, never. And so yeah, they're I, always one time. Every I want to be on the jury so bad, it's bucket list. Okay, well, let me, let me tell you. Every jury. Like, you see all this pool of mixed people, a mixture of people, and then the jury ends up being all white. Yes, I've, I've dealt with that frequently. So and how do we address that then? How can we what we're that? doing right now is I've been in contact with the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. They got a, a grant to help us get data to allow it to challenge the uh, jury pools. We have no data. In Douglas uh, County. See, if, if you have a, when you get your summons for jury duty, there's a, a section at the bottom, and this is a relatively new 
and it says race or ethnicity, but it's optional. So a lot of people don't answer the question. So this, this group, um, there are two lawyers from Drake University that I've been in contact with, um, and they were able to get some court rule changes and also some litigation that in their mind has significantly increased the likelihood of, of a better fair cross-section of jurors. I'm hoping that with their help and with this grant that we'll get somewhere. We've contacted the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. We've contacted some other members of the court. And we're planning on a uh, forum in December. Uh, and then another one with Justice Pencil after that. Don't put that on. There was a question here. I'm, so, I'm picking popcorn. When, when I was the election commissioner here in Douglas County, Normally, the jury came from a list of registered voters in Douglas County. Right. I know that time can make uh, someone who's calling potential uh, uh, individuals to be on the, uh, that can get kind of lazy and they begin to relay or rely on just a certain number and group of people who have been uh, uh, called several times. I would imagine that we should be looking at how many times those individuals have been called to be on a jury uh, as to whether or not they're trying to include or be more inclusive for okay. juries. Yeah, so, 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 a little bit different. Are you saying there are people who are constantly on juries I mean, and other people are excluded from juries? I, I think that's what we need to investigate. And we have no data on that. Is that what you're hearing? Not that I'm aware of. I could tell you that the clerk of district court now is the jury commissioner. Okay. And as was related earlier, the um, jury pool had, was expanded statutorily from registered voters to been added if you have a driver's license. Um, so that's the jury pool. They have a what they claim to be a computer program that anonymously or randomly picks who the jurors are. But you're right. I'll, when I pick a jury, I always say, how many of you have been on a jury before? And it's not uncommon. I haven't heard five times, but I haven't heard, it, I, it, it's not uncommon I've heard people say two or three. Now it is a ton of them. but. It's, you know, I've, I've never been called either. No, of course, right here. Right. And I, I think just to follow up, as, just as a general, as we all know, it's illegal to strike someone on a jury based on their race. Yeah, that's right. It's illegal to do that. But a lawyer can get three strikes for whatever other reason not based on race. So I guess what, I'm, what I want to kind of find out is, Although it's illegal to strike someone based on race, I can strike an African-American individual on a jury and say, well, I don't like the way she answered that question. And as a result of that, now we have an all-white jury. So I guess what I would like to see is, although it's illegal to strike someone based on race, how, what does, how does that play out now in the jury that's a good question, and that's also going to be part of this uh, grant that we have. There are some states that will no longer allow prosecutors to ask certain questions, like um, how many of you have had a negative experience with police officers? How many, yeah. Oh, well, y'all weren't supposed to answer. He was just hypothetically <laughs> said that. That's, that's, that's he right. wasn't right. asking y'all that question. He just used an example. The drunk prosecutor <laughs> will ask the jurors. How many of you hear gunshots in the in your neighborhood all the time? Um, and and at, there are all these coded questions that are going to be targeted at primarily people of color. And some of the some of the things we're going to try to do is by court rule preclude prosecutors from asking those kind of hot button questions that give them an excuse to do just what you just said. Because the case you're talking about is Bathurst, Kentucky, and it says that. Prosecutors cannot, or no one can strike people because of their race. But there's been cases since then by the, by the U.S. Supreme Court that said, as long as the the uh, 
re reason is race neutral, it's okay, even if it's not rational, which, which took all the teeth out of that case. So you're, it, you're exactly right. I'll, I'll have a Batson challenge and say, uh, you know, Judge, this African American juror had answered the question exactly the same way as this white guy who they left on the jury. Why, why did they strike him? Well, he had his arms crossed and he wasn't looking at me and you know, <laughs> BS like that. And that's the kind of thing that we're hoping will help us attain fair cross section of jurors by making some of these changes, whether or not we'll be able to do it, it's always an uphill battle with the Nebraska legislature or with the make, getting court rules. But let's face it, I don't care what your mindset is, no one's going to want to admit that they don't want to have a fair cross section of jurors. So we can shame them into it, I think. Folks, we only got about 10 minutes left, really five, but I saw two hands. Dennis, and you had one back here, bro? You had a question? Let's go Dennis first and then go ahead. I got mine. Yeah. Okay, did you, did you, you had a question? Yeah. Sure. Okay, yeah, you got a question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, because earlier you had said we need some kind of legal action to reconnect mm -hmm. the ability for IG's office to probe. But if it wasn't a legal action, it stopped it. It was a 38 page opinion from the AG here from Nebraska. So how come you can't write a 38 page opinion that's stronger than his opinion? I think there's a lot of bureaucratic stuff going on in our society right now that really misses the point. That's how people get disenfranchised and miss opportunities, get deprived of things. Um, let, 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 me, let me say what you're trying to say. You're basically saying, if I'm hearing you well, the AG's opinion stops a major action to do something good. No, and you're asking the question why that exists? Should somebody write a counter proposal? Is that what you're saying? Well, I think, I, well, I think that's a loaded question because you just assume the good. Um, I haven't seen a lot of good come out of the AG's office. We've done case studies on the AG's office, or the IG's office, excuse me. Okay, got you. But um, my question is still, so what do you do if you witness something that you believe constitutes an Eighth Amendment violation of one of your clients or something? Have you ever filed something? Yeah, we have. Yeah, we have. No avail. Can you explain a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah. Tell us more about yeah. how that works. Well, what, what typically we do, I mean, an Eighth Amendment violation is an excessive sentence. And we, we file excessive sentence briefs all the time. And the, by court rule, no, you get no oral argument. And they typically, the prosecutor, the AG's office, typically ask for summary affirmance, and frequently they get that, and that means they don't even write an opinion. They just say the, stat the, the sentence was within the statutory limits, and that's good enough for them. Do I agree with it? No. We, years ago, um, we, did, we did get a case to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was on, it was on the bail. Um, so scratch that. But yeah, we, we, we it's constantly that we're fi filing those things. Do we do federal, federal habeas corpus? Rarely. Um, it's a remedy that used to be uh, very effective, and now they procedurally default you constantly. And the rules that they have on federal habeas are such that if you're a state prisoner and the state court has already ruled on your issue, they're just gonna say, you're, we're not gonna hear it. That, that didn't used to be the case. We have time for one more. Yeah, one more and then we're gonna do a closing here real quick. So the Nebraska Bar or the commission or someone established this office of diversity, equity, and, and another name, Including. council. Yes, of council. So this council's office was established to address some of these disparities and recruiting more minorities to the legal profession and address some of these other issues through the Bar Association. Do you think it's been effective? No. Why not? What's your Because no, they aren't producing any results. Um, I am at a loss to see what they've done um, to, in concrete terms, to accomplish anything. I mean, you know, I've been on so many committees and so many um, well, committees that are going to address all these problems, and we're always in the minority. 
because they stack the committee with prosecutors, cops, hard nosed judges, and we make all these suggestions and they nod their head and then when the rubber hits the road, nothing happens. And I, I guarantee you, I'm on two more of these committees that they're just created. One is the Sentencing Review Commission. Um, Terrell's on it with me. And um, he was on the last committee we were on that tried to get through mandatory minimum sentences and reduce a lot of the other horrible criminal code. And we have we got legislation, Lathrop introduced great legislation. And even though the committee agreed that these were valid steps, the legislature beat six you know, Steve was crushed by that. Um, it, was, it was terrible. Um, we thought we had them in a position where there were gonna be a number of significant changes to reduce the overpopulation in prison. The committee was created to address that problem. And then when we said, here's what you need to do, make parole eligibility a little earlier, um, don't allow for these 49 to 50 year sentences that make, make it be, you know, the maximum you could get would be on a 50 year sentence would be 30 to 50 or 25 to 50. So at least you'd have some eligible parole. The judges can give 49 to 50. Now that means you're not going to get parole. You're going to jam out. You're going to have no no help in reentry. Um, you get your whatever they give you and your bus ticket. And see you later. See you um, back. Yes, yes. Folks, on that note, we're going to wind down. Terry, you want to make one last minute comment within a minute, and then also Tom, then I'll close out with that. One minute, if we can. One minute. One minute. We got the time for <laughs> um, It is my hope. Uh, that uh, one of the things that comes out of this conversation that we've had tonight, because I know a lot of people, somebody alluded to it, that uh, public defenders somehow, because they're paid by the state, somehow in connection with the prosecutor's office. That has not been my experience with working with the public defender's office the entire time that I was uh, criminal defense counsel. Public defender's office, uh, if I were able to ever able to uh, have someone who's charged with a serious crime, the Mr. Riley would be the person I would want him to be represented by, or her to be represented by, if you can't afford to get your own attorney. Because it wasn't me, because I love the Douglas County Public Defender's Office. It must have been somebody else. No, I'm not, I'm not pointing at anyone in particular. But I think that's the general consensus when you talk to people in the community that the Public Defender's Office somehow works. Right, no, I'm, I'm familiar with that. With the Prosecutor's Office, and that's simply not true. There's some very good, excellent attorneys in the office of our public defender, particularly our office. Some other offices I can't speak to, but this one I know for sure. Um, and I think we need to be able to have a larger conversation as to what that defense looks like uh, when you have to go to the public defender's office because of your economic conditions. Good, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things I've always tried to do is dispel that erroneous belief. And you know, the, the business we're in is result oriented. And if we have a case and we get a negative result, uh, sometimes people will look for reasons that it happened that can be conspiracy theories and that type of thing. Um, I can't do anything about it except try to rationally explain here's, here's what's what. Do I think the system's fair? No. Uh, can I, ch I'm not a policy maker. I can't change things. I have to fight within the, the system the way it's designed, whether I like it or not. The only way I can change it is through litigation, and that is a steep hill to climb, because as one of my friends who is now a judge and used to work in our office, um, when I asked him a couple of times about some of the judges that were being elevated to the Supreme Court, I said, what's the scouting report on him? And my judge looked at me, my friend, the judge looked at me and said, Thomas, you better win him down here. Mm. Um, and 
that's why all this jury stuff is so important because winning them down here is usually with the jury. Um, I've had cases I thought I should win that I didn't, and I've had, had cases I thought I would probably lose that I that I won. Um, and to me, the common denominator in that is what kind of jury did I have? Um, well. Let me let me get we'll, we'll, ready. We'll collect these. Yeah, we're gonna collect the evaluation. Folks have some popcorn there and some water. I didn't mention that earlier, but uh, feel free to help yourself. Uh, I'm gonna close off by saying three points. Number one, I really appreciate y'all coming out tonight. One of our goals with more is to get more community forums like this, like we used to back in the day, uh, where people talk directly to public elected officials. And I know it's rare to get a lot of them out in the north and south of Omaha. We'd like to see a lot more in south of Omaha where grassroots folks, grass tops can talk directly and learn things because, again, some of our families don't always go on the internet. They don't always have access to those brochures or whatever. So that's one of the reasons why we want to encourage people to do that. And again, on your evaluations, there's some things you think we as more can have focus on related to race, ethnicity, equality. That's where our mission is. But we also will push these other nonprofits who hide behind plexiglass doors and don't have nobody walking in their buildings. We sit out there in a counter and we see that they don't do the work that they used to do to bring the people in, but yet they still get money. That's a little shameless plug, slam. Second thing is, if you go to our website, we have some other activities that we're planning. We're planning a, a book reading group that's uh, gonna talk about decolonializing well. It's uh, the 18th and basically you can read the book. It's gonna be virtual so you can read the book. It was proposed by a volunteer. She bought the book and asked some of us to read it and have a discussion because the more people read and get stuff for themselves, the better they can help do public policy and advocacy work is that. And then the last thing that we wanna share is that we're gonna have a, a viewing of a time for building. Most of you may not be aware of that Omaha, Nebraska, 1966 had a video called A Time for Burning that was nominated for Academy Award, considered the chambers in it, and it's a classic, and I've showed it in many classes. I used to teach it then about a few weeks ago, a colleague showed me there's another follow-up video called A Time for Building. We're gonna show that at Augustana Lutheran Church and have a racial discussion about how have churches evolved in terms of race and integration in Omaha, Nebraska. So we invite you to go to our website, sign up for that, it's free and open to the public. But one of our goals at more is to bring more people into conversations with elected, as I said, public officials, and including nonprofits on how do we serve our community. So we are glad you're here today. And again, one of the things that we're really happy, we have one of our volunteers who helped donate the popcorn. And if you don't take it with you or whatever, I'm gonna take because I have a serious addiction to popcorn. I'm trying to get some therapy for that, but I don't think I want to get that. And uh, also make sure you fill out the evaluation forms. And we really appreciate you being here tonight. And we're always in our events and more and, and so on as we say, may the force be with you.